Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and before we get started on tonight's story, I want to tell you about the book that it's pulled from. It Calls from the Forest, an Eerie River Publishing Anthology, Volume 1. It's available through the link in the description down below, and features the story from tonight, written by N.M. Brown. On to tonight's story. The kids in my town play like other kids. We look like other kids. We sound like other kids. However, the kids of our town are not like other kids. Other kids, other towns, don't have New Mac Woods. It's heavily rumored that New Mac Woods is haunted ground. Legend states that if a child under the age of 14 travels into the woods after 8 p.m., they'll very distinctly hear a baby crying. I don't know why it's 8 p.m. Maybe it's because the sun's been long gone by then. I also don't know why the age has to be under 14, but I can take a guess. I'm assuming that it's because kids under that age still have most of their childlike innocence. They say the children are more sensitive to the supernatural than adults, so that's gotta have something to do with it. My friend Ricky Doyle lives down the block and over a ways from New Mac, and I'm staying at his house tonight. We've been talking about going out there for months. Just now, I've gotten the courage to set our plans into motion. We're going to sneak out at 8.15 and go check it out. Ricky and I are both 11 years old since his birthday last week, so that checks out too. We shouldn't have any problems hearing the baby. It was all figured out. A perfect plan. We'd eat dinner, pretend to go to bed, sneak out, hear the baby, and be back in bed before anyone else knew that we were gone. This was our chance to bring some credit to the story. No one we had known had actually gone to the woods. It was always a friend of a friend, or a cousin's girlfriend's neighbor, who supposedly went and experienced it. Not much went on in our town. There wasn't much to do. I've always been mischievous, constantly seeking out adventures, and Ricky needs a friend, so it works out for the both of us. His interest in all things creepy and spooky aren't as enthusiastic as mine is, and I think he mainly goes along with my plans because he just, well, he's just happy to have someone to hang out with. School dragged on forever, and finally it was time to meet Ricky for the buses. My mom wrote a note saying I could ride his bus home with him. Ricky's already at the bus loop by the time I got there. Aiden, hey, did you give your note to the front office to ride home with me? I take a piece of paper out of my pocket and wave it around like a flag of victory. I got the bus pass right here, I told him triumphantly. Uh, what's your mom making for dinner? I asked him. He told me that we were having spaghetti, my favorite. We ate quickly that night without a word. Not that there was much chance for one. We were shoveling in huge bites super fast, like we had been starved for a week. Ricky's mother smiled at us, and she brought out a piece of cheesecake for each of us after we had finished. You boys want dessert? Aiden, does your mom let you have cheesecake? I was about to open my mouth to say no thanks when I caught Ricky's eye across the table. He glanced towards the plates and nodded quickly at me. Thank you, Mrs. Doyle. Uh, I've eaten cheesecake with my mom lots of times. It's really good. Before long, we were saying our good nights, promising to brush our teeth. We stayed silent in his room after that, just waiting. I felt like I was going to jump out of my skin when it got closer to 8 o'clock. Occasionally, we'd get a glass of water from the kitchen or use the bathroom, which were mostly excuses for us to see what his parents were doing in the living room. We were trying to track their progress towards heading to bed for the night, and finally we heard their bedroom door close. Both of us had agreed to wait exactly 15 minutes after that to leave the house. With our jacket hoods pulled low over our heads, we dropped out of Ricky's window and entered in the backyard. It was chilly enough outside to where I'm thankful I brought my jacket, but not cold enough to be uncomfortable. Even if it had been really cold, the excitement in my blood would have kept me super duper warm, which is great. Aiden, do you have both flashlights? Ricky asked. I shook my head in response. No man, I thought you had yours. I just have this one. I held it up and waved the beam across his face. He winced, putting his hands up. Come on, it's bad enough I don't have a flashlight. Now you want to blind me completely? I laughed at this and told him that we could try to share mine. I didn't want to risk sneaking back in and out of the house again just for one flashlight. 
I had just gotten old enough to let my mom sleep over at her friend's house that wasn't in our neighborhood. We are just getting started with Numac, and I couldn't mess that up. We entered the woods, then spent a good 15 minutes walking around. We saw a huge black lump off to the right in the middle of the trees. My breath caught in my throat for a second, and I shined the light towards it. It was an old, broken down, and probably abandoned white car. The windows were broken out of it, so it was easy to see into. We walked to it and peered inside, making sure to keep our distance in case someone was living in there. It happens, you know. How the heck did this car even get out here? There are trees everywhere. Maybe it's been here since they were babies, Ricky said. I instantly corrected him, not missing a chance to show off. They're called, like, saplings or something. There's no such thing as tree baby, I scoffed at him. But then I thought about everything else they had said. You know, that's a good question. It doesn't make sense that the car has been out here like this. Hey, when it's daytime, we should come back and check it for broken glass. If not, it could be ours. We could be the only 11-year-old kids at school to have a car. Or maybe we can make a base out of it, I suggested. We continued to walk on, agreeing to check out the car again tomorrow. The trail was difficult. Both of us kept close together to share the beam of light, but that made us bump into each other a lot. Like a pair of Siamese twins in some kind of weird three-legged race. We were bumbling and tripping over any and everything in our path. It was a blast. We were chuckling and stomping around so hard that I could barely hear any other noises. But something weird got my attention. I shushed Ricky by putting my hand up, pointing to my ear to signal him to stop and listen. There, under the noise of the wind through the trees, I could hear something. I tried to sharpen my ears and block out any other sounds. Yeah, that was it. I couldn't believe it. I didn't know whether to feel scared, excited, or worried. Ricky, do you hear it too? The baby. C c can you hear the baby? Even in the moonlight, I could tell that Ricky's face had turned a lighter color than normal. His eyes were wide, and he clenched his hands together. Yeah, um, maybe we should go now, he mumbled to me. I grabbed him by the arm a little more aggressively than I meant to, keeping him in place. Well, I'm going further. If you want to go back, fine, but remember, I have the flashlight. Sorry, I said, smoothing his army jacket out like that would somehow erase the act of me grabbing him. I just want to get a bit closer to make sure that we're not imagining it. Come on, please. We've come this far. We can't head back just yet. Against his wishes, he reluctantly followed me on through the woods. Both of us more scared than we're willing to admit. We seemed to get closer to the sound for a while, but then it just... stopped. Ricky looked satisfied, like he knew that he would start heading home then. He was happy that we got our answer to the stories of Numac Woods, but for me, it wasn't enough. It didn't really answer anything, it just made more questions. I wanted, I needed to know where, if anywhere, it was coming from. The cry sounded very real, so I thought that maybe there actually was a baby out there. Maybe they were cold and hungry. Maybe they needed help. My mom had a baby a few months ago. She's super annoying, screams and pukes all the time, but I would never want anything bad to happen to her. T to any baby, pukey or otherwise. Ricky wasn't having that, though, and he all but dragged me the way that we had come. I followed Ricky back to his house, and we snuck back in through the window and tried to go to sleep. His parents were none the wiser. At first... I couldn't help thinking about the woods and the baby, but but after a while, the warmth and fluffiness of Ricky's bottom bunk's quilt cuddled me into a deep sleep. Eventually, the lullaby of our snorts and snores drifted out of the cracked window and into the night. The next morning at home, I took advantage of my mom's tiredness, asking her after a long night awake with my sister if I could stay at Ricky's again on Friday. Unless you want us both to stay over, I wriggled my eyebrows at her. What's one more kid in the house, right? I said. Mom turned to me, giving me an offended smile. Don't you pull that crap on me, Aiden Stewart. I would have said yes if you didn't try to reverse psych me, she joked, kissing me on the forehead as we walked past. I'm glad you two are such good friends, she added before leaving the room entirely. The school week was long and uneventful. 
It seemed to drag on and on. You know how things get when you're really looking forward to something. Things become a blur with the end goal in sight. I did all of my homework and went about the motions, mentally counting down the days, then the hours, then the minutes until Friday. The day had come. I came to school more prepared than last week. I had extra batteries, two flashlights just in case, even some nighttime snacks and Gatorade. It would be just like we were going night hiking, if that was even a thing, which I'm pretty sure it's not. I brought the game that Ricky wanted to borrow too, and we met up and rode the bus to his house just like last week. We went through the evening having what they called Mr. Doyle's famous golden chicken breast this time. The excitement had eaten away at my stomach over the day, and I didn't eat as fast as I ate the spaghetti. Mrs. Doyle had bought some mini cupcakes at the store and gave us each two. We played some video games to keep ourselves occupied until his parents went to their room. Before long, we were out in the night air again. It was cold tonight, but in a different way. It was the kind of cold that my mom says will settle into your bones, whatever, whatever that means. My breath came out in puffs, and my teeth were trying their hardest not to chatter together with chills. I shook it off and pulled my jacket tighter around me, my hood over my head again like some kind of thief or ninja. The vastness of the woods could be confusing, and it's easy to get turned around in there, but I felt less worried when we passed by the weird car. We both had our flashlights, and I breathed a little bit easier, because I knew that we were on the right path. I had no idea where we were going, though. I was just walking, hoping to hear the crying. Now, I know it sounds crazy to want to stay, but I had a plan. I had made sure my dad's phone was charged the night before, and I took advantage of my parents' new baby exhaustion. Uh, again. I tiptoed into my parents' room like a ninja this morning to grab my dad's phone, turn it off, and then put it in my backpack without anyone seeing. But it was all so that when we went back into the woods, I could actually record the crying, or any other creepy stuff. Now this time we didn't stop at or even mention the car as we passed by. A once treasure of a find gave way to a bigger mystery as soon as we got further down the trail. I got the phone out and turned on the flashlight feature, my excitement slowly turning into fear. I felt like I could totally puke right then, but I didn't. Ricky would have loved to use that excuse to leave the woods, so I tried to stay at least kinda calm. The thing that caught our attention just after the car was a hatch, like the kind on those bunkers in war movies. We started to cautiously approach the metal hatch, which was positioned on the ground. We could see the moonlight glint off of it a couple of feet away, and I barely listened as Ricky begged me to walk away. And then I heard it. A noise startled us, something that sounded like a rock being thrown on concrete, and then the loudest scream I'd ever heard in my life came from inside. The volume was so intense and distorted that it almost didn't even sound like a baby anymore. We scrambled back and I dialed the police emergency number on my phone. I told them where we were and what our names and ages are, and when the dispatcher asked what the problem was, I held the phone out towards the metal. I yelled, practically screaming into the phone, We're alone in New Mac Woods and there's a baby in this metal door thing. I think it needs help. Common sense told me that an unattended baby underneath a metal hatch would not have survived over the week from when we last heard it, but it sounded so real. As we were waiting for the cops, a figure came running towards us through the woods. I haven't ever been good at fight or flight. The freeze in place is more my thing. And after a moment, we started to run, knowing that it couldn't be the police that soon. The figure loomed closer to us, his walking speed nearly matching that of our running speed. And when I looked back the second time, Ricky's face disappeared from sight, and a cry cut through the woodlands. My heart dropped, and I realized this time the screams, the screams didn't belong to a baby. I ran back to Ricky's house alone, and his mother held me tight as I told her what happened. They called the police, and, and my parents too. Not feeling like they had the option not to, my mom cried hysterically on the other end of the line, and I knew that she'd probably be mad later especially since she had to get dad to wake up, then get the baby ready, and then come pick me up. By the time my parents arrived, the police had just knocked on Ricky's front door, and the officer politely waited for my parents to enter the house before entering it himself. He looked... disturbed, like he'd seen something terrible. Please tell me it's not the baby. I couldn't hold back my anxiety any longer. 
Officer, did you find the baby? Is, is it going to be okay? He said a few hushed words to the adults. And my mother buried her face in my father's chest. I think she was holding back tears. The officer cleared his throat and he asked me to sit down. He assured me that no babies were hurt or in danger. Then he started to tell our parents what the police found out there in New Mac Woods. Inside the metal hatch. It appeared to be locked from the inside and... They were the first adults to hear the baby cry since... Besides the 911 operator. After some attempts, they managed to pry it open and the... The officer paused. He told me to leave the room, but I heard him. I, I heard all of it. What they found inside wasn't a baby. It was a, it was a very thin, weathered old man holding a tape recorder with a play button pressed. He was bare except for a pair of dirty, brief-style underwear that appeared to be stained with old blood. His teeth were also reported to have been reddish in nature. And his grey beard was streaked with crimson. The only sign they found of my friend was his blood-covered jacket and his flashlight. On March 1st, 2020, I returned home from my week-long business trip. I'm not ashamed to admit that after after hopping out of my Uber, it took a few extra minutes on the sidewalk, just getting my bearings, you know? Well, the light in the living room was on. Anna was home. I took a deep breath, picked up my bag, and went inside. Dawn! Finally, I was getting worried! She stood in the living room doorway. My wife. She wore a long, dark dress. Her black curls framed her face, falling freely. Her eyes were the palest gray, at odds with the rest of her coloring. Her eyes lit up as she saw me, and I almost trembled. I caught the feeling, forced it down, and strode forward to embrace her. I missed you, Cookie. <laughs> uh, something smells divine, aside from you, I mean. She giggled like a schoolgirl. I ordered some pad thai. Anna did not cook, but she did remember my favorites. I spent the next half an hour gorging on Thai takeaway. I was almost silent, but who could fault me? Hungry and tired and presented with a delicious meal. Anna was content to watch me eat, pleased with herself, and afterwards I excused myself to the shower, joking about smelling like a ten-hour plane flight. I scrubbed myself red and raw, sluice with scalding hot water. I stayed in the shower until the physical sensations took away every other feeling. And then, for five more minutes. Anna was waiting for me in the bedroom. Naked, as you might have expected. She stood against the window, bathed in moonlight. Her smoldering stare on me. She was... She was gorgeous. Every inch of her, and despite the ever-present terror in the back of my head... The taste of bile in my throat. I was aroused by her immediately. I let myself feel that lust, let it course through my body and heat up my stare to match hers. Come to bed, she said. And so I did. Someone rang our doorbell incessantly the very next morning. I rubbed my eyes and looked at the clock. 9 a.m. on the dot. I was allowed to be late at work the next day after a business flight, and I had intended to make full use of that. I was dimly aware of the movement of my wife's dark silhouette rising from the bed. Sleep, sugar, she murmured. I forced myself upright. I'll go with you. Why? Just rest. She fixed her stare on me. You don't trust me to take care of some vacuum salesman or whoever that might be? Maybe I don't want you to deal with that shit alone. Or maybe I can't bear to let you out of my sight. I punctuated the last word by pinching her butt. She giggled and threw my sweatpants at me. 
Hand in hand, we descended downstairs and found a plump, middle-aged woman on our porch. Hi, she said cheerfully. I'm Beth. I moved into 39A just last week, and I brought you cookies. She thrust the tray towards us, rather like a battering ram. How sweet of you, Anna exclaimed, taking up the tray and looking at me proudly. I'm Don, and this is my wife, Anna. I figured I would introduce myself to my new neighbors, especially since I noticed the lady on the house is often around in the mornings. I am also a morning person, so I thought that we could make great friends. Beth hit us with another bright smile. She reminded me of my mother, but then she continued. And I wanted to compliment your house. Such a lovely little place. Shame about your garden, though. Anna tilted her head to the side. The train of empty pleasantries running from my brain to my mouth came to a screeching, panicked halt. What do you mean? You got such a beautiful house. But the garden! Overgrown bushes, trees that need trimming, weeds everywhere. Dear Lord, I'm not sure that you ever have had a lawn. Perhaps you would like some help taking care of it. I mean, I could recommend just the most amazing landscaper. Thank you. But we prefer it this way. Anna spoke up before I could. She looked at me proudly again, but I could see the way that the muscles tensed under her jaw and down her neck. This wild yard is just out of place with the rest of the house on the road, don't you think? It would be very neighborly of you to clean it up a bit. We sought out an area with no HOA to be free to decorate as we see fit. I shot both Beth what I hoped was an apologetic but firm smile. Thank you very much for the cookies. I'll return the tray myself. Now, if you forgive us, my wife and I need to prepare for work. I guided Anna back into the house. When the door slammed shut behind us, Anna let out a long, angry hiss. Bitchy neighbors are nothing new. Cookie? I murmured. I'll go around with the tray tonight. Make sure that she understands the message. No response. Cookie, please. I know you're a strong, independent woman, but let your dumb husband feel like a knight and solve this problem for you. Fine. Anna drawled. But she woke you up. And I was so happy that you get to sleep in before working. Well, I let the tension out of my body with a well-practiced, casual stretch of my arms. I took the tray from Anna's hands and set it down on the windowsill. Then I forced a cheesy smile on my lips. I guess since I'm awake anyway, we need to find something for me to do before work. She pounced at me before I finished speaking. I damn near had a heart attack before her lips found mine. My job wasn't the best in terms of pay and benefit, but made up for that with flexible working hours and work-from-home arrangements, and trust me, I really needed those work-from-home arrangements. I had a client meeting at 4 p.m. Then at 5, I planned to go home, but the meeting turned into a massive project meltdown, and to put it bluntly, there was no way I could have gotten home before 10 p.m. without risking my job. Should have risked my job. I knew something was wrong the moment I walked up the porch. I, I knew precisely what was wrong. The smell was familiar enough. I tasted fear and suddenly dry mouth. Felt it in my muscles aching with tension. I made myself step forward. And again until I was inside my house. She stood in the living room doorway. My wife. Her dress was stretched over larger, deformed shoulders. She stood hunched over, concealing the rest of the room from view. But the pool of dark liquid around her feet was telling enough. I wanted to run. I wanted to run so fucking bad, but I knew that I couldn't. Nothing to do with my duty. One, one simply does not run when there is a hungry predator in the room. Anna? I called softly. Gently. She turned toward me. Her long curly hair was matted with blood. Her jaw jutted forward and I could see her fangs. Her blood red eyes centered on me. That moment of adrenaline. She looked at me hungry and angry and deadly and I forced my arms apart and said, Hi, Cookie. Had a tough day? Not a hint of shock in my voice terror or accusation. Damn, if it wasn't for the working hours, I could have been an actor. Anna straightened up, slowly returning to her human form. 
Do you like me to make you tea? I asked. Nice green tea. Maybe with some peppermint. No. The voice was hers. Let me finish here so there's no mess. For the first time, I dared to take my eyes away from her. I glanced at the ruined corpse of Beth at my wife's feet. The throat was gone completely. The tongue laid three feet away under the coffee table. The belly was torn open. Intestines dug out and strewn around. If I'd known my wife, she had gone tongue, belly, throat. She liked to watch them struggle. But she had learned enough in her life to keep them silent. But in that long, long life, she only had one fiancé survive until the wedding, let alone past it. I'm so sorry, sugar, she said. I know you don't like the mess. It's okay, Cookie. I know the, the bitch was getting on your nerves, not to mention you're looking kind of hot like this. I gave her a thumbs up. A split second later, I realized my arm was shaking and quickly put it in my pocket. You're so silly. She giggled. The best husband ever. Come to bed quick and I will show you the best husband. She giggled again. I casually walked upstairs, then rushed to the bathroom and threw up every bit of food I had that day. From downstairs, I could hear horrible tearing, slurping sounds. I curled up in the bathroom floor and cried. I took a sacred vow the day I married my wife. On March 2nd, 2020, I failed that vow. I failed Beth. It wasn't the first time. It probably wouldn't be the last. Still, this burden was mine to bear until death. Until death do us part. And I had a very good idea of how that would occur. There's no reason I would put exact dates in my post. I didn't want any of you accusing me of breaking the shelter in place. I mean, I know how Reddit gets about that. Rest assured, Anna and I have been observing the quarantine. We've recently gotten around to making candles together. I don't think that she quite gets the point, but it's something that I like and it's romantic enough to keep her happy. We usually have candlelit dinners and laugh over how ugly our candles are. Our neighbor, a decent man named Benjamin, no relation to the mysteriously disappeared Beth, told me a joke over the fence. How for men quarantined with their wives, it probably wouldn't be the virus that kills them. You know, the one. I laughed. Told him quarantine was more like a second honeymoon for us. I neglected to mention that I had almost gotten murdered by my wife during the quarantine, when I had accidentally shown revulsion at something that she'd done. The very last moment I managed to pretend that the whole thing was a bad joke and apologized for it with an offering of a sensual massage. I've gotten a lot better since then. No, at least I, th I thought I had a routine going. See, in my work, an excuse to escape the house when everything became too much. Now that I'm stuck at home with her 24-7, it's much harder. She, she watches me all day. Every moment. Every fake smile, every forced laugh. She lounges in my lap as I work. She wakes me up with kisses that carry the hint of her teeth. Every time I emerge from the bathroom, I'm afraid that she heard me sobbing hysterically inside. God, I'm so afraid. I sure fucking hope that she doesn't find this post. Probably, It's probably dumb of me to post it, but I can't, I can't exactly tell this all to a therapist. I curse the day that I decided to take this duty upon myself. I, I got myself a hero. Who would silently protect the world from my wife's hunger. Instead, I've become a prisoner whose life depends on telling dumb jokes that she likes. I better go. We're making rose-scented candles tonight, and Anna promised me a special surprise. I won't pretend that Catherine Lawrence was the greatest mother. With all the drinking, the late nights, the strange men in her life. I'd say I'd spent more time raising my siblings than she did, but I can never quite hate her for that, you know? No, she, she wasn't a good parent. But despite her flaws, I loved her up until the end. You know, dying 
Surrounded by family and loved ones is what everyone seems to strive for, and our mother... Our mother succeeded in that much. Before us, she'd be alone. No family to speak of. No living parents or grandparents, brothers or sisters. No one. Mom didn't often talk about her life, but my understanding was that she'd been orphaned when she was young. It had always been just her against the world. Maybe that explained why she slept around so much. Maybe she was afraid the men in her life would abandon her, so she abandoned them first. Maybe she just liked being the center of attention during a new romance, or maybe it was... Maybe it was something else entirely. In 32 years of life, I never once thought to ask, and even if I had, I doubted I'd ever have gotten a legitimate answer. My mother kept a lot of things to herself, and there were there were parts of her that she'd never share with anyone. I understand that now more than I ever did. She was 57 when she died. I'd, I'd still say that she died young. Before cancer wore her down, she could have still passed for being in her 30s with her long, dark hair and her reserved demeanor. I'd always thought that she'd end up outliving all of us, you know, given how healthy she'd always been. She'd worked blue-collar all her life, mostly construction. It left her with a surprising strength. That woman didn't look like much, but if she hit you, you'd feel it day after the next. That said, she's also a lifelong smoker, and when that caught up to her, there wasn't a damn thing anyone could do to stop it. She spent the last few years of her life fighting for her life, staying with my brother Lucas, who helped her as much as he could during, during her decline. Cancer might just be the cruelest way to die, you know? The way it shreds a person down until they're just a shell, nothing short of horrifying to watch. I visited Mom and Lucas as much as I could, and each time a little more of her was missing. When the end came, it was, it was almost mercy. Her death didn't come as a surprise. We had years to prepare. During her final days in hospice, Lucas and I, we made sure the family was all together. Mom had grown up alone in this world, but we wanted to make sure that she didn't die alone. But there were eight of us. Family resemblance was hard to see sometimes. Most of us had come from different absent fathers, scattered around different parts of the country, but we were all hers. As the oldest, I'd helped raise just about all of them. I can't imagine our family dynamic was the healthiest, but I know that most of my siblings look at me almost like a father figure. I do my best to be there for them. Lucas had made space for us at his place. Eight people plus Lucas's family was a lot, but we made do. They only allowed a handful of people by our bedside, so during those final hours, most of them waited at his place. Lucas, myself, and our sister Nancy stayed at her bedside saying our goodbyes. When she flatlined, it was sudden, without ceremony. She died in her sleep. One minute she was there, the next... The next she was gone. And the room remained silent. The funeral was nice, but um, you know, there was only a few of us there. Eight of us and our families. Since it was just us, there really wasn't much of a reception. We'd gone back to Lucas's house and sat around in his backyard under the indifferent May sun. As I stood on his deck, looking out at my siblings and their families, I felt a tragic sort of nostalgia. It had been years since we'd all been together. I'd I'd watched most of these people grow up for my entire life. As the oldest, it was my duty. Lucas had been her second son. At 30, he'd done all right for himself as he stood beside me watching all sorts of familiar faces in his backyard with a pair of beers in hand. At a glance, you might not have guessed that Lucas and I were brothers. He had dark hair, darker skin. I was white and blonde as they came. As I said before, our mother slept around. The men in her life would stay for only a few months before she'd move on. Then more often than not, we'd find ourselves with a new sibling on the way soon after. Hate to see the gang back together under these circumstances, Leed said. 
His voice was quiet and grim. Yeah. Guess we knew it was coming, I said. Awful as it is. We should all be so lucky. He offered me an open beer and I took a swig. In the back of my mind, I remember the first time I'd had a beer with Lucas. Mom had been out. We'd just gone through her fridge. I'd been almost 15 back then. It'd been terrifying. She'd somehow find out, but she never did. The memory almost made me crack a smile. Hey, are you heading back to the house tomorrow? Yes. There was a hesitation in his voice. I took a sip of the beer and nodded. Yeah, might as well get a head start on cleaning it out. I'm sure there's things that you'd like to keep. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. And you know what you find, he said. I saw a ghost of a smile cross Lucas's face. You know, it's funny, back when we moved in the house, to get the shit out of me, I was still like, I don't know, what, 10, 11? You remember how I had that room by the kitchen? Yeah, with Jack and Kyle, I said. My eyes fitted to those two siblings in question, both in their mid-twenties and starting their careers after college. At that moment, they leaned on the fence at the far side of the yard, probably having a conversation not too dissimilar to the one I was having with Lucas. Yeah, I used to think the house was haunted and you'd hear the house settling some nights. The spot I was in right in the corner and banged and groaned constantly. That house had a basement. <laughs> you could have thought something was living down there. Might have been an animal in the foundation, I suggested. The mention of a basement made me pause to think for a moment. Did any of the houses we lived in have a basement? Lucas paused. No, I don't think so. Or maybe the one in Kentucky. I think there was a window near the backyard, but you couldn't see anything through it. I said they filled it in. I shook my head and took another sip of my beer. Weird. Lucas nodded in agreement before he gave me a pat on the shoulder and let me on his porch. Mom's house wasn't as big as you might expect a house that raised eight kids to be. It was a ranch-style house that sat on an unassuming suburban street. The exterior was a little more run down than the others. No one had really taken much care of it over the past few years, and just like Mom, it had deteriorated. The driveway was empty as I pulled my rented truck out front. I still had my keys, and I knew that going through her things would take a few days. Lucas would be along to help me after most of the rest of our siblings went back home. The house didn't need all of us in it again. A musty smell invaded my nostrils as I set foot inside the house again. The floorboards creaked under my weight. Lucas had only provided minimal upkeep to the place while Mom had been with him. He had more pressing concerns. I brought a few cardboard boxes with me, and I figured I'd start with the kitchen. If there was any food left in there, it probably needed to be thrown out. Otherwise, I could probably take stock of the appliances. The ones in better shape could be sold. I was a little surprised to find the house still had power when I tried the lights. Although, I noticed the fridge had been unplugged and emptied. There was a few perishables left in the pantry, but not many. What was left was covered in dust and... Rat shit meaning it was definitely trash. So I focused first on getting rid of those. Mom's kitchen barely had room for all of us. Space had always been a bit of an issue. When we were younger, we'd slept in bunk beds and shared rooms. Privacy wasn't much of a concept, but Mom didn't seem interested in stopping anytime soon. She'd kept having kids, or at least trying to. The eight of us were the ones who'd gotten to grow up. One of our siblings had been stillborn. Two had been miscarried, and one had died in the crib. We'd move every few years, although I couldn't say why. Mom said she got bored of her surroundings. We lived in several different states, Texas, Washington, Louisiana, Oregon, and uh, Kentucky. Didn't even remember which state I'd been born in. As I emptied the pantry, I let myself reminisce on old houses and good memories. I cleared out the top pantry first before I moved to a little walk-in. It was shallow. I remember she'd kept it up. Or I remembered she'd put it up herself shortly after we'd moved. It sat in one corner of the kitchen and held sturdy. Mom had always told us not to go fishing through it since she was afraid it might collapse in on us. 
I can't see why. She clearly known what she was doing. Still, she once blew up and screamed at Lucas when she caught him looking through it. There were fewer perishables in there, so I spent less time cleaning it out. I went from top to bottom, picking out everything and dropping it into a fresh garbage bag. Most of them were old soups that zero out of eight kids wanted to eat. I had no idea why mom bought these. I spotted the corner of one can near the back and reached to grab it. My fingers brushed something cold and metal as I did. For a moment I thought it was another can, but it felt... different. I didn't think too much on it and reached back to get it. Now, whatever it was, it was it was round, it was smooth. I tried to tug on it, but it wouldn't budge. It jiggled, though, almost like a doorknob or something. There was no way in hell that she kept a doorknob in the pantry. I bent down, peeking into the dim light. My senses hadn't been deceiving me. What I'd felt was definitely a doorknob. sat near the edge of the pantry, as if the whole thing was meant to cover up a door. I turned the knob and I, I pulled. The entire pantry opened towards me. The hinges creaked a bit and I watched in confusion as the door the pantry had been built over opened up. I stared at it for a moment, a little dumbfounded. And how the hell had that been there for so long I'd never noticed it? My eyes shifted downwards towards what lay behind the door, and I saw stairs leading downward into a basement. I stared at them in quiet disbelief before I approached the stairs. They were concrete, sturdy, which hopefully meant that they were safe enough to walk on. I took my first step down and began my descent. Why the hell had Mom hidden the basement from us? Now this didn't make any sense. What could she possibly hide down there? I knew I'd get an answer soon enough. See, at the bottom of the stairs was another door. It was open, although it, it looked as if it was designed to be locked from the outside. I only lingered on the door for a few moments, but what, what interested me the most was what was beyond it. The room on the other side was bare cement. I saw bricks where basement windows had once been, and an old metal cot with a moldy old mattress in one corner. A stank of mildew. Standing in the room made me feel claustrophobic, and yet, as I looked around, I felt my pulse beginning to race. What the fuck had Mom been doing down there? That room was clearly meant for someone to live in, I, I think. Although it seemed more like a torture cell than anything else. My eyes were drawn to the concrete walls. I could see scratches in them, near where the windows had been. Dark, rusty smears were near one of the windows, as if someone had tried to dig their way through the mortar. They'd worn their fingers away to bloody nubs in the process. My heart raced as I stared at them. I felt I felt dizzy and, and uncomfortable. I felt the walls were closing in on me and I backed towards the door immediately. I half expected it to slam shut and lock behind me, but thankfully it didn't. I ran up the concrete steps and I burst into the silent safety of the kitchen. My hands were shaking, my skin had gone white. I didn't know what I'd seen. Not really. Part of me didn't want to know. Part of me wanted to let Mom take that one last horrible secret to her grave, but I knew... I knew I needed answers. I wish I, I, I could let it be, but... But I, I needed answers. I didn't tell Lucas about what I'd found, not immediately. I didn't even go back to his place, instead I just found a place to sit quietly as I wrote down things that I remembered, like our old addresses. It took a bit of research to find the phone numbers of the new recent occupants, but I mean, I had all afternoon. I remember what Lucas had said about the house in Kentucky, how, how he'd seen a basement window, but Mom said that it had been filled in. I wondered who filled it in. Naturally, I started with Kentucky. The man who answered the phone had a pleasant accent, and he answered my questions about the basement as he spoke. My body felt... It, it felt colder and colder. He said that the door to the basement was at the back of a closet. It had been unfinished, and the windows had been bricked up. He said nothing about supposed blood smears or, or old bed frames. I can't imagine Mom would have left anything too incriminating behind. 
And I got a similar answer when I called our old house in Oregon, although the homeowners weren't nearly as polite. I didn't want to call anyone else. I didn't, I didn't have it in me to go through each and every old house. I was born in Idaho, 1987. I never met my father. My mom told me his name was Malcolm Donaldson. Malcolm. She even named me after him. I looked him up once. Didn't find much. Strangers, politicians, nobody who it made sense to reach out to. I mean, way at the bottom of this list, though, way at the bottom was a man named Malcolm Donaldson who disappeared in late 1986. A few towns over from where mom had lived. I might not have gone through all the addresses, but I looked up the names of every man I remembered mom bringing home. I, I found most of them, at least... At least reports on most of them. The reports say they're either missing or they're dead. And for the ones they found, the cause of death was almost always starvation. I'm, I'm not sure why mom chose that. Letting people waste away alone in the dark. I'm not sure about anything anymore. I don't know what I'm going to tell my siblings. This is all too much to process. It's not that... It's not that mom was a, a serial killer. No, as horrible as that is, I find that I can accept it. I can even accept the fact that what she did to her victims was nothing short of sadistic. The part I can't process, the part I can't, I can't accept, is the fact that now I know what we were to her. She didn't have us because she wanted us, or even because because she was too stupid to use a condom. No. No, we were mementos of her sick crimes. Fond reminders of the atrocities that she'd committed. We were trophies. My name is Clem. I grew up in a little town in South Louisiana called uh, Chickapin, about an hour west of New Orleans and right in the end of the deep bayou. There are channels everywhere and you can make it from my backyard all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico by boat. We spent some time in the water just about every day since I could remember. We knew the waterways in Terrebonne Parish like the backs of our hands. Me and my cousin Rake, uh, we were about the same age. We were partnered up a lot when we were kids. There were times when we'd spend most of our days in the bayou, hunting, fishing, and trapping. And that's what life was like. For the longest time, that's about all it was. But there was one particular day, night, I should say, that stands out above all the rest, though. A night I still had bad dreams about all these years later. It happened when we were about 12. Me and Rake. So we'd gone out in the bayou late in the evening to run some traps. Daddy and Uncle Billy pretty much let us do whatever we wanted because they knew they could trust us. They knew we knew our way around and they knew we could handle ourselves. We were also supposed to stay inside certain boundaries. To the south, that meant staying out of the ship channel and not foraging over any land barriers that would let us get too far from home. We usually minded those boundaries, but, well, sometimes we didn't. The night I'm talking about was one of those nights when we decided to take some liberties. There was a series of traps we'd set along a part of the bayou we couldn't get in our little aluminum boat unless we either skirted along the edge of the ship channel for a ways or else portaged across a small stretch of land around a hundred yards or so. Once we'd paddled out the ship channel and saw that it was clear, well, we decided to take our chances. The wake from even a small ship could swamp us if it passed too close, but we could see far enough both ways to feel comfortable. Besides, portaging along was always a pain, especially in the dark. We made it about halfway to the channel we were heading to when things took a turn. I was in the back of our boat, so I saw it first. A small freighter coming up from behind us. I got Rake's attention and pointed out to the ship. We both knew what to do without further discussion. Dug in deep, paddled as hard as we could. Still, I yelled at Rake to paddle harder as the ship drew near. I could see the edge of the channel we were headed to as the ship's bow pulled even closer with us. 
To tell the truth, I half expected to get wet. But we turned into our little channel just as the ship's wake reached us. We rode on top the wave for a ways until it died down, then we laughed. And we thanked our lucky stars. Semi disaster avoided. It was a pretty clear night. There was a full moon over us with only the occasional cloud, so we could see well enough to navigate even without our flashlights. There were cypress trees all about, and the Spanish moss hung thick all around, giving the trees a ghostly air. I love that about the bayou. It always gave me a sense that I was a part of something that wasn't quite squared away. The first trap we came to didn't have nothing, so we moved towards the next one. And it was around a bend in the little peninsula that was just barely higher in the water. And as we paddled nearer and rake shine the light, we both saw it. Two bright eyes shining back at us. And from the looks of them, they belonged to something large. You could always feel in your heart. You could always feel your heart rate get up when you caught something, especially if it was bigger than a coon or a possum. I could tell this was... This was bigger. Now, we were eager to get there, but because we were seasoned trappers, we knew to take our time. Steady strokes. Do nothing to get the animal more excited or scared than it already was. We must have still been about 40 or so feet away when Rake stopped paddling, though. I stopped, too. We kept drifting slowly toward the bank. And I shined my light at the trap and finally saw what we'd already seen. It, it, it wasn't a, a normal animal there in the bank. At least, not one we'd expect to catch. It, it was a gator. Well, not just any gator. But maybe the biggest gator I'd ever seen. It, it had to have been 16, 18 feet long. 1,500 pounds, if it was a pound at all. It also wasn't caught in our trap. It was just sitting there on the bank, looking right at us, sort of grinning, like, like he was inviting us on up. You know, come on, boys, I got room. Rake had done the right thing by not making any sudden movements, but my body didn't seem inclined to follow suit. I began paddling backwards as hard as I could, and in no time flat, I'd stopped our forward progress and started us back in the way we came. By then, there was no point in Rake staying still, so we started paddling as well. He turned us around so our bow was in front, and we stayed at it, and by then, the gator had slithered into the water and disappeared beneath the surface. And talk about your heart rate going up. My heart was rattling in my chest, like that playing card that I'd stuck in my bike spokes. Even though it wasn't common for a gator to chase after a boat, we kept going till my arms burned like they were about to fall off. Then we both stopped paddling and we looked, we looked behind us. Rake stood up in the front of the boat so that he could shine his light at the water back towards the peninsula without me blocking it. I saw several water moccasins swimming towards the light as they were prone to do, but I didn't see no gator. It occurred to me though that the light was likely to attract a gator as it was a snake. So I yelled at Rake to put the light out. He did, but it was too late. Just as he switched it off, I saw it rise up. The top side of the gator's massive head, not more than five feet behind us. His big eyes focused right on me. I could see the water rippling too, way back behind where his tail was swimming slow. And good lord, he was big. Rake saw him too, but I yelled at him anyway. I was already paddling before his butt hit the seat, and we both started digging at the water as hard as we could. It wasn't but a few seconds later though, that something bumped up against the side. So hard it almost tipped us over. Rake lost hold of his paddle and it went into the water, but I didn't care. Once the boat had settled, I kept paddling. We had a 22 caliber rifle and a 22 caliber pistol in the boat with us. I didn't figure either one of them would do good against the gator hide, but since Rake had lost his paddle, he grabbed up the pistol. The gator pushed up against the side of our boat again, but not as solid as before. It didn't cause me to break stride. There was another bump. Then a while later, it felt like the gator tried to come up from under the boat, so it lifted us up on the water and then it went away. I paddled for just about as long as I could and then I stopped. I could see the ship coming from where we were. I told Rake I didn't think it was wise for us to go out in the ship channel, especially since we didn't have what one paddle. Now, of course, we could come across something unpleasant on land if we chose to portage, but as long as we had our guns, we should be able to manage. So that's what we decided to do. 
In any event, we didn't need to sit where we were for very long. That gator could have gotten bored and moved on. We couldn't be sure of that. We needed to move. Rake shined his light over the left bank, and pretty soon he found the spot we usually used as a landing. I started moving us in that direction, but no sooner than I got us turned that way, Greg yelled at me to look out, and he fired several shots right past my shoulder. I turned just in time to see the huge gator coming at me, his whole head out of the water with his jaw wide, and just about to come over the stern. I remember thinking that in a split second how big his teeth were, but they were huge. Anyway, I launched myself forward towards Rake just as the animal landed its head where I'd been sitting, and all at once the boat pinched up hard and rolled. Me and Rake landed in the bayou. The water was so deep enough to be over our heads as close to the ship channel, and I was disoriented at first, having gone under in all that blackness, and of course, it didn't help that I was completely panicked. But soon enough, I remembered to stay still and look for light, and I saw some, some pretty quick moonbeams on the surface. Now, I swam up to the top. The boat was upside down, but it was just a few feet away from me. I got hold of it at the same time the rake did. I sure was glad to see him there, but I was just as aware that we truly were in mortal danger and I had to get going. Rake said it too. We had to get on land. We had to get to the bank. I said that we should stay on the boat and we did. Him on one side, me on the other, paddling towards the shore, and we had just reached the point where our feet could touch bottom when I felt something brush up against my leg, something heavy and rough. No doubt it was a gator, but its body scraped up on my thigh all the way from its front legs to its back. I was so scared, I felt like my soul was about to shoot out from my body, and I couldn't help but freeze. I stood perfectly still. Rake asked me what was wrong, but before I could answer, the gator took hold of him and yanked him under. I know it's not manly at all, but I screamed. I called his name over and over, but I couldn't see him anywhere. Him or the gator, for that matter. No sign at all. I wasn't really, really thinking clear by then, neither. But I managed to turn the boat back over, climb in, and as fate would have it, the only thing left in our boat was my paddle. No guns, no flashlight, no nothing but my paddle. It had got jammed up under the seat somehow when the gator had come crashing down on it. And needless to say, maybe, but by then I had become hysterical. I mean, I didn't... It didn't seem real. I mean, how was it possible that my cousin was out there somewhere under the water in the jaws of a... Of a huge gator. It was too awful to consider, yet, yet that seemed to be the story. That was what there was. That was all there was. Gators didn't eat you right away, neither. They took you under in a death roll and you were drowned, and then they stuffed you under a ledge or a log or something and left you there to rot. And once you're ready, they come back for you and they eat you. Peace by peace for all the world and everyone in it how could that be my cousin Rick's destiny to rot under a log and be ate up by a huge gator there was nothing though no sound but the occasional hooting of an owl and the croak of a bullfrog and I thought I heard a big cat growl but other than that, the bayou was quiet. Then all of a sudden, not far from me, there came a big splash and a fuss about the surface of water. I saw Rake. He was trying to swim away from the gator, but the gator was practically on top of him. And only a second or so later, they both went under. Now, this was horrible. The most horrible thing I could imagine, and I was living it. I paddled over to where they had gone down, but there was nothing to be seen. A few seconds later, though, they came up and more towards the middle. I yelled out his name. He managed to look my way for a split second, and then he yelled my name. Then the gator took him under again. I don't know how I knew, but it was clear to me right then and there that hearing him call my name like that and seeing that gator take him under would haunt me for the rest of my days. I started towards where they'd been, but then they came up again, more towards the bank. This time, not only did he call my name, but he also screamed the word help. And scream it, he did, like... Like nothing I'd ever heard, the sound of his voice was the embodiment of terror, and we... And hearing it, my skin crawled all over. Then, like before, they disappeared beneath the water, and the last thing I saw was Rake's hand, clawing at the air, trying to find anything to grab hold of. I desperately paddled towards him. I started looking. 
hollering for him, bending over the side of the boat so far to see under the water that I almost fell out. Too long. You've been under too long this time. There's no way he could still be alive. I, I came to know that in my heart and feeling of evil and darkness like I'd never imagined possible began to settle over me. This was more than I could bear. I didn't see how I could ever find my way to any form of sanity. I could feel it in my whole body like a weight, like a poison. I could barely breathe. Suddenly, without any warning at all, something came crashing to the surface of the water, right beside my boat like it had been shot out of a cannon. Miracle of miracles, it was Rake. And he was most of the way on the boat before I could even get over and help drag the rest of him the way in. He flopped to the boat's bottom like a big fish, and before I could fully grasp the reality of what had just happened, he screamed at me to paddle and get to the land. He wouldn't shut up about it, and finally, I made my way to the seat and started paddling for shore. Rake was breathing hard and moaning just about every other breath, but I, I couldn't... I couldn't tend to him just then. I had to get us to shore. I was afraid to look over my shoulder to see if we were being followed, but finally I couldn't help it. Sure enough, there it was. That big gator was right behind us, no more than three feet back, just skimming along with nothing showing but the top of his head and back, with his tail squishing back and forth real slow. Just a few seconds later, I ran the boat aground. I hopped over Rake and out the front so I could drag it all the way up, and once I'd done it, I looked over fully expecting to see the gator coming up after us. But to my surprise, I didn't see him nowhere. I didn't quite trust it. I, I mean, I, I, it could have popped out of the water at any moment. But the relief I felt that instant was indescribable. And anyway, whether the gator was coming after us or not, I had to get farther from the water. So I dragged the boat a good 20 yards on land. And only then did I dare give Rake a good look. What I saw was ghoulish. He had blood on him in a lot of places, but the thing... The thing that got me the most was his leg. His right leg. From the knee all the way down to his foot, there was... There was nothing but bone. No skin, no meat, just bone. A little bone in back was just hanging loose. I could see where the big bone was almost broken, too. The thing I found most odd, though, was that his shoe was still on his foot. His leg had gone through all that, and somehow his shoe had managed to stay on his foot. Anyway, I tried to talk to him, but he wasn't making no sense. I could see that his leg was bleeding bad from just below his knee. And I knew that he was bound to bleed to death. I couldn't find a way to stop it or at least slow it down. Frankly, I didn't know how to manage the presence in my mind, but somehow right then, I knew what I had to do. I took off my belt, I wrapped it around his thigh right above the knee, and I pulled it tight, tight as I could. And then I wrapped it around again and tied it off. I could see the bleeding slow. Seemed like by a lot. And no sooner than I got the belt cinched in place, though, I heard the low growl of a big cat, maybe the one I heard when I, when I was still out there in the water somewhere, real close. Maybe it had been watching, stalking us, waiting to see if we'd managed to escape the gate or make it to dry land. And by the time, no doubt, smelled all the blood that was wetting its appetite, I had to admit that my imagination was fear-fueled, overdrive, but that wasn't a doubt in my mind that there was a panther nearby and that it was going to come after us couldn't just sit there, wait for it to attack though. So I hopped out of the boat and I started dragging it. This wasn't easy by myself in the dark, with Rake lying up towards the front end. I almost tripped several times over roots and such, but I managed to keep my balance and keep going. I could hear it though. I, I could hear the big cat pacing us, probably waiting for the right moment, and I stopped to listen. And it stopped. It started back up and it came along. It was crazy. I felt, I felt completely vulnerable. Yet I was unable to do anything about it. If only our guns weren't at the bottom of the bayou. I made it about three quarters of the way across and I had to stop to rest just for a minute. But I had to stop. And that's when it happened. A panther came at me in the flesh. Knocked me back into the boat. Came down on top of Rake. Panther came down on top of me. I knew in my heart that we'd come to an end because there was a full grown cat on me. And I was just a boy all alone without any means of protecting myself. 
The moment was near. I could he I could feel it. And just when my will to live was about to succumb to the panther's desire to eat, though, I heard it. It was a shot coming from nearby, and in that instant, the big cat went limp, fell lifeless on top of me. I scrambled out from under it, managed to find my feet in a hurry. What a strange memory. The, the sight of seeing Rake and the panther lying side by side in the bottom of that boat, one barely alive, the other one dead as a stone. It seemed like a dream, even then. But I knew it wasn't. You know, just then, I, I felt a hand on my shoulder. It was my daddy. And I can say with complete confidence that I'd never been so glad to see somebody in all my life before or since. Him and Uncle Billy and two of their friends had come looking for us when we hadn't made it back for supper, and luckily for us, they had. I told them what had happened real quick and just as quick. Daddy and Uncle Billy carried us to their boat, took us back to the house so they could get raked to the hospital. Their friends stayed back. They had a gator to hunt and kill. Rake lost his leg below the knee, but he kept his life. I still don't understand how he managed to get away from that big gator, but he had. Can't even imagine what those few minutes must have been like for him, you know, fighting against that beast under the dark water. Unlike me and the panther, I've always thought that maybe his will to live had been stronger than the gator's desire to eat. Maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. All I know for sure is that all these years later, I still travel all over those bayou channels. So does Rake. And just like when we were kids, sometimes we follow the rules. And sometimes we don't. Have you ever messed with something that you don't understand? And I'm not talking about when you were a kid and your friends used to dare each other to chant Bloody Mary 50 times in front of the bathroom mirror. What I mean is going somewhere unfamiliar and thinking you're safe just because you have a good feeling about what you're doing. Trust me, I know what it's like. You're having a good time. The adrenaline kicks in because you're experiencing something new. It's easy to disregard any rules that were outlined before you left. It's this kind of recklessness that claimed the life of one of my friends when I was young. Poor, innocent soul who didn't need to die. This is the story of the dangers of disrespecting the supernatural forces which lurk in the shadows of certain places. I'll tell you the story as best I can. Some of the details might be a little vague because this is this is more than 10 years ago. It was the summer in the town of Park Ski, California, and the heat was beating down on us as we walked down the same route that we had every day from school. But this fateful Friday, there was an air of excitement about our group. Well, at least between me and Emily. Jeremy wasn't so keen on our plan. What if someone sees us? We'll be in so much shit, my parents will probably ground me for life, Jeremy protested, booting a stone along the ground. The youngest of us three, Jeremy was a, a typical shy kid who tended to keep to himself around others. I'd known him since I was born. Our parents were very close. He's a sweet kid with a heart of gold, though he did lack some self-esteem and was bullied at school because he was scrawny. Oh, come on, don't be a pussy, said Emily. It's going to be awesome. We'll be the first people to ever do this. Emily, on the other hand, was the opposite. Outspoken, strong-willed. She was the one who came up with the idea to sneak into the water tank on the edge of town at night. The tank had been drained by the state water company for repairs. Emily knew this because her dad was good friends with one of the workers and had mentioned it at dinner the night before. At recess, Emily came bounding up to me and Jeremy had commandeered us for the trip, saying how cool it would be to sneak in and check out the inside of the tank. While I thought it would be fun, if a bit dangerous, Jeremy wasn't super interested. The water tank in question was on the outskirts of town. It was a hulking, rusted monolith that I'd overheard some parents call an eyesore. It was well known that some of the seniors at our school would sneak through the fence around the tank during the summer to go swimming, but I never heard of first years doing it. I guess that was part of why Emily was so keen. If we pulled it off, 
We could brag about it at school and maybe even become popular for a while. Ty, you aren't going to bitch out on me too, are you? Emily asked. I probably should have mentioned my name is Tyler, or Ty for short. And while I really wasn't excited by the thought of being grounded again, I had to admit the idea of trespassing for fun, it sent a thrill through me. It gave me a sort of anxious feeling in the pit of my belly, but I couldn't deny that I was excited about it. I'm in. We both turned to look at Jeremy, who took a deep sigh and rolled his eyes. Fine, but you better know what you're doing, Emily. Like, you should make sure that it's safe and shit. He trailed off. Emily grinned, grabbing a hold of a nearby street sign and swinging around it happily. Ain't nothing safe about what we're doing, she yelled. I'll see you tonight, at the place. After I finished tea, I told my parents that I was going over to Jeremy's place to play some video games. Something that happened regularly on Fridays. The plan was that Jeremy would tell his parents that we were coming to my place to play video games. Next level mind games. But when we met in the middle of the street, I noticed that he hadn't packed light by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, his backpack was near overflowing. By contrast, I changed into some jeans and a jacket, put a torch and some snacks in my backpack, and that was about it. We all knew where to meet anyway. Dude, you really need all that stuff? I asked Jeremy, looking him up and down. Jeremy nodded, unzipping his bag and producing a number of items, including a compass, water bottle, pocket knife, and a rain jacket. I want to be prepared, you know? Y you never know what could happen, he said. I think you're prepared, but... Are you ready for the ghoul that lurks in the tank? I said, shining my torch underneath my mouth and putting on a deep voice. Jeremy nudged me with his shoulder. Knock it off, dude, it's not funny. He lurks at the bottom, waiting to consume any who dare to enter. Seriously! Jeremy smacking into me harder this time. The force of the blow sent the torch out of my hand and into the air, turning end over end before smashing into the ground. I groaned, picking it up, to reveal the bulb inside it smashed. I pointed it at Jeremy, frowning. What am I going to do now? Lucky I brought two, said Jeremy, tossing me a new torch. The sun had well and truly set by the time we met Emily at the agreed meeting spot. We were standing at the beginning of what was known as the town's industrial estate, a failed experiment by the council to attract bigger companies to invest in the area. The space was left fairly bare as only a few companies had actually invested in the space. There was a small solar farm on the left side, while a number of business hubs lined the right. The path down the middle led to a hill atop which the town's water tank stood. The hulking metal structure groaned in the wind as we approached. As if protesting being without the water usually inside. The light continued to fade as we walked. How are we going to get through that fence? Asked Jeremy as we neared the base of the hill. The tank was surrounded by barbed wire fence that stretched around its base. From where we were, I could see the iron zigzagging stairs on its side, but no way through the fence. There were a few construction vehicles around the outside, but I couldn't see anyone still around. That's why I brought these, said Emily, producing a pair of wire cutters from her backpack. Emily's green eyes shone in the darkness as she grinned at us. We're already trespassing. You want to add vandalism to our rap sheet? I asked, meeting her stare. I don't see any cameras. Do you? Emily shot back as we reached the top of the hill. Before Jeremy could add his own protests, Emily got to work creating a hole in the fence. I turned to look at Jeremy. He was staring up at the water tank, seemingly in a daze. You okay? I asked him, trying to see what exactly he was looking at. I didn't realize it was that tall. Jeremy said, gazing up at the rickety stairs on the side of the tank. Do you need me to hold your hand? I joked, before I also realized that the tank was at least 50 feet off the ground. Emily turned around. My work here is done. You guys okay? I quickly swallowed the lump in my throat and turned to face her. Yeah, let's go. Practically forcing Jeremy along with me, all three of us crawled through the small hole Emily had made in the fence. Inside the construction area were a number of workstations, as well as cranes, trucks, bulldozers, all bearing the Parkski water logo. It was now completely dark, with the only light coming from our torches. 
The wind was howling, creating a chill that was only mitigated by the fact that we had all layered up, though some more than others. Inside the construction area were a number of workstations, as well as cranes, trucks, and bulldozers, all bearing the Parsky water logo. It was now completely dark, with the only light coming from our torches. The wind was howling, creating a chill that was only mitigated by the fact that we all layered up, though some more than others. Jesus, I'm freezing, squealed Emily as we approached the stairs. She was wearing a long t-shirt, but no jacket or jumper. The T had Fallout Boy emblazoned on the front with an image of the band performing. Trust Emily to rep her favorite band in a situation like this. Probably should have been prepared, smugly said Jeremy. Yeah, well, you're prepared not to come at all, so... Emily was drowned out by a huge gust of wind, which blew into us onto the unprotected hillside. I staggered as the water tank made another loud groaning sound. Bracing myself on the ground, I looked over at the others. Emily was backed up against the construction trucks while Jeremy had fallen over, dirt staining his jacket. As the wind subsided, I got to my feet and looked at the others. You guys all right? I asked. Emily nodded. Yeah, I think so. That was crazy. Jeremy, who had turned pale, didn't reply. You okay, Jeremy? I said trying to meet his gaze, but he was staring off into space with a horrified look plastered on his face. His eyes were kind of glazed over, and his breathing was shallow. I... I... I think he's in shock or something. I stuttered, not entirely sure what to do. Emily walked over to Jeremy and placed her hand on his shoulder. Jeremy? You in there, buddy? Suddenly, his head snapped back. His eyes sparked to life. Oh, what the hell was that? Jeremy said, gasping in between each word. Emily put her left hand on Jeremy's shoulder, trying to get his attention. Look at me, Jeremy. Look at me. What happened? Jeremy finally looked at her. I heard someone in the wind. It's like a voice coming from... from in there. He said, extending a shaky finger and pointing at the tank. It was like some old lady, and when she was talking to me, I couldn't move. Emily and I exchanged a look. I was beginning to get seriously freaked out. What did she say? I asked him, anxiety building in the pit of my stomach. She was yelling. Something about her son. She was calling for help. Jeremy said, still seemingly dazed from the incident. Did you hear anything? I asked Emily. No. Did you? No. For a moment there was silence, as we all took in what had just happened. I never knew Jeremy to be someone who would make stuff up like that. He could be a wuss, sure, but I, I doubted that he'd make this up to get out of going into the tank. Especially when we had already come this far. Trust me, I know what I heard, said Jeremy, crossing his arms. Dude, look, I believe you. What do you want to do? He said. I won't blame you if you don't want to go in, said Emily. That's freaky. No. Jeremy's answer took me by surprise. I was fully expecting him to back out. We go in there, we find her. If someone's in trouble in there, then we should help them, he said, his eyes narrowing. Uh, do we actually know if there's someone in there? I mean, if there is, maybe we shouldn't go in, I said, my anxiety beginning to build. Oh, come on. We're... Are we really going to let some creepy voice stop us after we've come this far? Questioned Emily, raising her eyebrows. If someone's in there, for whatever reason, there's three of us and one of them. So I ain't scared. I sighed and relented. All right. Let's go. The stairway leading up the side of the tank was very narrow, so we had to go in one at a time. Emily volunteered to be in the lead. I followed behind her and Jeremy brought up the rear. The stairs creaked as we climbed them. The wind at our backs. My heart was pumping hard in my chest, the thrill of discovering something new racing through me. At the same time, I felt something akin to dread in the pit of my stomach. I couldn't help but replay Jeremy's words in my mind. She was calling for help. I shivered, a chill running up my spine. My hands clinging to the metal bars of the stairway, they were growing sweaty. 
We were now about halfway up the stairs, and I was resisting the urge to look down, keeping my eyes solely pinned on Emily's back. Oh man, I heard Jeremy say behind me. Just don't look down, Emily said as we passed the halfway point. <sighs> Easier said than done. Suddenly, another gust of wind ripped through us, causing the stairs beneath us to shake. My eyes grew wide. Holy shit, I blurted out, trying to hold onto the side of the stairway. Emily squealed, trying to keep her balance in front of me. In that moment, my hand slipped off the hand railing and I fell back. Sticking my foot out to stop my fall, I almost twisted my ankle before I slammed chest first into the handrail. The collision knocking the wind out of me as I gasped for air, I, I gazed into the darkness below. I felt like I was looking down from a skyscraper. The trucks and cranes below looked tiny now, almost like toys. Taking a few breaths, I staggered back, rattled, but grateful to be alive. Jeremy put his hand on my back. Ty, you okay? Yeah, that was... Man, we are up high, I said. I think I almost peed myself, said Emily shakily. That drew a chuckle from Jeremy. First time you've been scared all night. You guys all right? I asked. I'm okay. Yeah, we should keep going before it gets any later. I glanced up at the remaining stairs on the top of the tank. They continued to wiggle as the wind blew through, not giving me the greatest confidence. I don't know, with the wind the way it is tonight, it doesn't look... It doesn't look particularly safe, I said. No, we need to keep going. I frowned at Jeremy. This wasn't like him. Before the trip, he barely was even interested in coming. Why... Why did he feel the urge to get in the tank as soon as possible? Why's that? I asked him. Someone's there. Then another word, Jeremy pushed past me and continued up the stairs. I glanced at Emily, who looked just as confused as me. But we couldn't leave him. We were too far in. We, we had to keep going. Regardless of what was waiting for us inside the tank. But slowly, steadily, Emily and I followed Jeremy up the remaining stairs. Eventually, we reached the top of the tank the cool night air whistling over our heads. From here, we could see the city lights dazzling in the distance. It was a really stunning sight. One I was tempted to capture. Pausing for a moment, I pulled my phone out of my pocket, clicked the unlock button, but then nothing happened. I tried again. Still nothing. The hell? Emily turned around. What's up? My phone won't work. It's probably out of battery. I mean, you spent way too long on it in class. I sighed. Come on, just try yours. I really want to get a shot of the lights from up here. Emily reached into her pocket to produce her old school phone, the Nokia Brick. Mine doesn't work any- Jeremy! I jerked my eyes to where Emily was looking. Jeremy had already made his way halfway down the stairway inside the tank, uh, completely on his own. He had abandoned us without saying a word. The next few moments went quickly, as Emily and I bolted down the stairs after Jeremy. We yelled at him to slow down, but to no avail. As we got deeper into the tank, closer to the bottom, my mind was racing. Why was Jeremy acting like this? I'd never known him to abandon his friends like that. It was as if something had taken over him, possessed him, after he said that he had heard someone speaking from inside the tank. And that was exactly where we were heading now. The darkness seemed to swallow Emily and I as we stepped off the final step and onto the base of the tank itself. The space we were in was huge, but Jeremy was nowhere to be seen. The only sound was coming from water dripping from parts of the walls around us. The cloudy night sky was visible through the wooden slats on top of the tank. The ceiling now removed. Jeremy! Called Emily, moving further into the unknown surroundings. His name bounced around the walls of the tank, creating an echo that grew in intensity before drowning out. No response. He's got to be down here somewhere, I muttered, reaching into my pocket and producing my torch. I pressed down on the switch. I again got no response. Just like my phone. Figures, I said, showing Emily that the torch no longer worked. It's like some kind of EMP or something. Emily turned to me. A what? Forget it, you don't play, Cod. Guys? The voice sounded shallow and sounded far away, but it was unmistakably Jeremy's. Jeremy! Emily broke into a run towards the voice. Keep talking! I yelled right behind her. I'm over here! 
He plunged forward, water splashing into the air as we ran through puddles. Just as I felt we were getting close to Jeremy, I heard Emily gasp and fall forward, head over heels. She landed on the ground with a loud thud, and I managed to stop myself before I suffered the same fate. Shit, that hurt, muttered Emily. Looking down at the ground, I could see there was a pile of wooden slats stacked onto it, most likely left behind by the workers. As I bent down to help Emily up, who was lying crumpled on the ground, clutching her ankle, my eyes were blinded by an intense light filling my vision. Jeremy, is that you? I said, shielding my eyes with my arm. Oh man, I'm glad to see you guys, Jeremy said, pointing his torch down at Emily, sufficiently blinding her as well. I continued to help Emily up, but she broke free of my grasp and charged at Jeremy, shoving him in the chest. The hell are you thinking? She yelled, slightly limping. Why did you leave us like that? I honestly don't know. It was like I blacked out or something, Jeremy said, a response that stopped Emily in her tracks. You blacked out? Last thing I remember, I was... It was Ty saying the stairs looked really dangerous at the top, and I was going to agree, but then it was like I skipped time. Next thing I knew, I was down here, Jeremy explained. He didn't look pale as he had before, which was reassuring to see, but I couldn't help but feel the urge to leave the tank right then and there. This entire night had been plagued by weird events, and I really just wanted to go home. I'm glad you're okay, but I don't really understand what's happening here. You're getting possessed, and none of us have our electronics. Well, except for yours, I said, pointing to Jeremy's torch. You almost blinded me, by the way, Emily chipped in. My bad. I'm just getting some bad vibes about this whole situation, I said, peering at the both of them in the light of Jeremy's torch. And just as Jeremy opened his mouth to respond, there was a loud crash from above us and the sound of wood being broken. Quickly, Jeremy pointed his torch up, just in time to illuminate one of the wooden slats from the tank's roof, plummeting down directly at us. Without thinking, I grabbed Emily and pulled her away from the path of the falling timber. We hit the ground hard, just as the wood slammed into the ground, millimeters from our legs. I looked over at Jeremy, and he had also managed to barely avoid being squashed, managing to dodge out of the way on his own. At that moment, I realized I still had my arms wrapped around Emily as we laid on the ground. I blushed and quickly let go, getting to my feet. The hell was... I told you to come alone! I froze as the words bounced off the walls and reverberated in my skull. I clutched in my ears as they echoed around the inside of the tank. It sounded like they were coming from a woman somewhere ahead of us in the darkness. Jeremy's torch was no longer shining, leaving us completely blind. My heart thumped in my chest as I met Jeremy's gaze. I only want you. Suddenly, the sound of wood being torn apart returned. Another wooden slat crashed into the ground somewhere to our left. Oh, God! I heard Emily whisper. We need to get the fuck out of here, I said trying frantically to figure out which direction we had come from. My child! Another crash, this time closer as another piece of timber slammed into the ground. The woman's voice was so loud it left my ears ringing every time she spoke. I tried my torch. Of course, nothing. Feeling with my hands, I found Emily to my right. I grasped her hand tightly while searching for Jeremy with my left hand. Jeremy, grab my hand, quick! More slats began to fall around us, each one closer than the last. Bang! 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 Finally, Jeremy's hands grasped mine. Wasting no time, I began to run, pulling them along with me. I tried vaguely to move in the direction that we'd come in, but hampering matters was the fact that Emily had clearly hurt her ankle when she tripped earlier, so she couldn't run as much or as furiously with a limp. Emily, are you- Don't worry about me, just keep going, she said, clearly in pain. I prayed that I was going in the right direction, but it was impossible to tell in the darkness. We could be running around in circles for hours. And just as I was beginning to get my bearings, I felt Jeremy's hand being ripped away from mine. I whipped around and couldn't quite believe what I saw. Jeremy had dropped the torch, and it was on the ground, blinking on and off, so every couple of seconds, we were getting a glimpse of the situation. Jeremy was being lifted up into the air by a gangly-looking woman who was covered in rotting flesh. Her skin was dark gray, and her body was oozing liquid from every orifice. She was wearing torn, waterlogged clothing that seemed to sag on her body. Her arms and legs were covered in scaly wrinkles, spotted with openings that looked almost like gills. The woman's green eyes bulged as she stared at Jeremy, a wide smile forming in her thin, decaying lips. 
My boy, she said, opening her mouth and sliding out a grimy green tongue. As she licked the side of Jeremy's face, I stood there frozen. I wanted to help my friend, but I was paralyzed by fear. Let him go, yelled Emily, charging at the gruesome woman. Stay away, she screamed. Her scream was so loud that it stopped Emily in her tracks, bringing her to her knees. I felt like my head was going to explode as I collapsed to the ground. The woman's face twisted into a snarl. She walked forward and lifted her foot into the air, bringing it down with tremendous force onto Emily's already injured ankle. I saw Emily's face contort in pain as she clutched her foot. I would have heard her scream if my ears weren't still ringing like crazy. But I could see the intense pain etched into her expression. Smiling, the woman leaned forward and kissed Jeremy on the cheek as he violently tried to wriggle free from her grasp. I could see the fear in Jeremy's eyes. I knew I had to do something. I couldn't let my friend down. Not again. This whole night, Emily had been the one to throw herself into danger to help Jeremy, but I'd always been too much of a pussy to actually do anything. Making sure the woman was still distracted by Jeremy, I slipped my backpack off and grasped it in my hands, slowly, silently getting to my feet. I stepped forward, and I launched the backpack at the woman with as much force as I could muster. It collided with her face, causing her to lose her grip, and Jeremy, eliciting a shrill scream from her lips. No! As Jeremy scrambled free, I ran over to his torch and grabbed it, quickly shining it around to find the exit. The light emanated by the torch continued to flash on and off, showing me short snapshots of every different part of the well. Wall, wood slat, puddle. Come on, come on, I muttered. Give him back! My heart was pumping furiously in my chest, and my hands were cold and clammy as the woman's shrill voice invaded my ears. Leave us alone, bitch! I heard Emily scream somewhere in the darkness. At that moment, I almost lost grip on the torch, and my hands slipped off its handle for a second. On instinct, I thrust out my hand and just managed to grab it before it collided with the floor. I want my child! I heard Jeremy. God, no! Gritting my teeth, trying to block out the panic around me, I raised the flickering light again. Night sky. Construction tools. Stairs. Stairs! Yes! I yelled. The light blinked off and then on again, only this time the grotesque face of the woman was illuminated. Her expression twisted into a snarl. I jerked back, but it was too late. The woman reached out and grabbed the torch in my hands, hissing wildly, and suddenly everything came to a stop. My eyes were filled with bright light as I experienced a shock so intense I thought I was going to pass out. I recoiled. The torch slipped out of my hands. The next thing I knew, I was on the ground in the fetal position, my limbs shaking. I was in utter agony. The pain felt like someone had sucker punched me in the balls twice. Ty! I heard somewhere disembodied voices in the darkness. I could only barely hear them over the white noise invading my ears. Next, I heard their footsteps pounding on the ground, coming closer. Then, Jeremy's face came into view. He was holding the torch I dropped. Holy shit, Ty, are you alive? I heard him clearly that time, the effects of the shock beginning to wear off. Barely, I croaked out before my, my breath caught in my throat and I launched into a coughing fit. Jeremy put his hands on my back before I felt someone else slide next to me. I felt a hand on my neck, two fingers, checking my pulse. You can have permanent damage. It looked like some kind of electric shock, Emily said. I could hear the concern in her voice, so I turned to look at her. You're pretty busted up yourself, I said, nodding to her mangled ankle. I'll be fine. Jeremy's the one who got slobbered on, she responded, smirking at Jeremy. His response was to immediately heave his guts onto the floor, as if the memory was stained in his mind. I'm never going to follow you guys into a water tank again, by the way, Jeremy said, his face gone completely white. What happened to her? I asked, realizing we were no longer being pursued. Jeremy wiped his mouth, shined his torch to our left. See for yourself. The light illuminated the body of the woman. Her flesh was charred, smoke rising from her eyebrows. Clearly, she'd been shocked just as bad as I was, maybe worse. Is she? Emily trailed off, gazing at the motionless woman. I don't know. I don't think we should hang around to find out. 
I know I'm not. I want to get as far away from here as possible. Whoever, whatever she is, Jeremy said. He extended his hand to help me up. As I grasped it, I felt an aching pain radiating across my palm. I jerked my hand back and saw the gnarly burns indented into it. At least I'm not unconscious, I said, shrugging. Jeremy helped Emily up, who braced herself on my shoulder. I brought my arm around her waist to support her. We slowly made our way towards the stairs like some three-legged race contestant. While we moved, I began to actually think about what had just happened. There were so many questions. Who was this woman? Was she even alive in the first place? She looked like a drowned corpse. But somehow she could walk and talk. And boy, could she talk. I doubted I'd ever be able to hear her properly for days. The woman was also fascinated with Jeremy for a reason I didn't yet understand. Regardless, the first order of business was to get the hell out of Dodge before any more weird shit happened. We began to ascend the stairs, which creaked beneath our feet. Just take it slow, I said. We had made it halfway up the stairs when I heard Jeremy curse. I flipped around to see that all that was left of Jeremy was his head in his arms. One of the stairs had given way and he'd fallen through, his hands clutching the ground, the only thing stopping him from plunging into the darkness below. I cursed under my breath, crouching down and extending my arm to help Jeremy. Emily reached out to help bring him up. We slowly began to lift him up, but suddenly... Suddenly we felt resistance on the other end. Someone was pulling him back down. He's mine! The woman seemed to have unnatural strength. It felt like I was in a tug-of-war with a giant. It, it was then that I realized that either she had jumped up to grab him and we were pulling against her entire body weight, or she'd somehow contorted her own body to reach him. I'm not going to let go, repeated Emily. But it was no use. Jeremy's eyes grew wide as he slowly began to be pulled back down. Guys, guys, please, he said, tears forming in his eyes. I felt my heart sink as Jeremy was ripped from our grasp and plummeted down to the floor, landing with a, a sickening thud. Emily began sobbing quietly as all the other noise suddenly stopped. There were no more falling slats, there were no more screams, even the wind had died down. I took a deep breath, I prepared for the worst. Slowly, I looked through the hole that Jeremy had just fallen through. On the ground lay Jeremy, with the woman's arms wrapped around him. He had landed on her, and he was alive. I breathed a huge sigh of relief. Jeremy! Jeremy, you okay? Jeremy slowly managed to raise his hand and give a thumbs up. I turned to Emily, who was looking bewildered. He's alive, I said. Well, we'll go get him, she exclaimed, relieved. I turned back to Jeremy. I'm coming! Leaving Emily, I began racing down the rickety stairs, hopeful for the last time the night. Reaching the floor, I tried my torch, finding it was now fully operational. Lighting up the path in front of me, I was able to find Jeremy easily. His clothes had been torn, his eyes looked glassy, and his backpack had nigh exploded from the impact, but he was still breathing. Hey, buddy, I breathed. Almost out of breath from pounding down the stairs. Hey, he croaked. The old woman's arms remained wrapped around him, so the first order of business was to, to pull them off. I grabbed the grotty, decomposing arms, tried to pry them apart. No give. My anxiety began to build as I struggled mightily to try and loosen her grip, but it was no use. Her grip was unnaturally tight. When a disturbing thought went through my head. She looked like she was dead. But hadn't she looked that way the whole night? Just as I was pondering this, the woman's mouth fell open and water began to pour out of it. And this was no stream. This was like a full-born torrent shooting into the air, raining down on Jeremy and I. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. I gasped as foul liquid began to pool around us. What's happening? Asked Jeremy, still semi-conscious. Don't worry. I'm going to get you out of here. I tried to reassure him. No, I couldn't pull her arms off myself. I picked up the torch and began searching around for something sharp to try to cut through her grasp. 
Scanning the ground, my eyes fell on a saw that had been lying next to a two-by-four piece of wood, likely left behind by a worker. Hurry, Ty! called Emily, who was no doubt watching in horror at the situation unfolding below her. Picking up the saw, I quickly returned back to Jeremy, who was now nearly submerged in water. If I didn't free him now, he would drown. Gritting my teeth, I frantically began to try and cut through the woman's arms with a saw. Sickening green liquid began to ooze from her arms as I desperately hacked away. The smell was like nothing I'd ever experienced. It smelled like like death mixed with vomit. And I gagged as I continued to cut through the woman's sagging flesh. I closed my eyes and I tried to block out the sight and smell of what I was doing. I just focused on dragging the saw up and down and up and down and I felt the saw collide with something hard and brittle. I opened my eyes to see something white sticking through the gore of that woman's arm. I had to cut through her bone, but I didn't know if I'd be able to hack through it. Jeremy coughed and heaved. The water level was now nearly above his head. <laughs> I tried to support his head as I cut, and I helped him breathe, but it didn't work. I, I couldn't keep his head up and hack through the woman's bone at the same time. Ty, said Jeremy, coughing loudly. I don't want to die. I know. I know. Tears stung my cheeks. I could barely will myself to look at him. I, I didn't want to watch my friend die. Knowing I had little time left, I let Jeremy's head sink underneath the water and grasped the woman's arm with both hands. Quickly, I brought my knee forward and braced it onto her arm. With all of my strength, I pulled backwards, trying to snap the bone. Nothing. As much as I pulled, the bone resisted. As if it was completely locked in place, a feeling of, of helplessness rushed through me as I heard Jeremy sputtering. No, 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 I said, slamming my fist under the ground. There was nothing I could do. The water level had risen too high, the liquid was still spilling out of the woman's mouth, and now Jeremy's head was almost submerged. Having barely made it through the woman's first arm, I... And I gave up. I dropped the saw and I met Jeremy's eyes. Tell Mom, I'm sorry, he said. Tears running down his face and mixing with water. And before I could reply, the... The water rose above his head, completely submerging it. Jeremy thrashed as he tried desperately to get, get a breath of air, but I knew it was no use. And I couldn't bear to watch. I stood up. And I began to wade my way through the water back to the stairs. I'll tell her. Emily and I ascended the stairs in silence. She hadn't spoken to me since I'd made it back to her. I could tell she was angry, but I couldn't keep pretending that nothing had happened. What the fuck are we gonna do? I said, breaking the silence as we reached the top of the stairway. The water had now almost completely consumed the stairway, but it was no longer rising. Emily paused, her back turned to me while she was propped on a wooden slat that she had been using as a walking stick. The question hung in the air, daring either of us to answer. Emily, say something, I said, tears beginning to well up in my eyes. It's my fault, Emily responded, turning to face me. Two black streaks ran down her face, her makeup unable to hide the devastation of losing a close friend. I pushed him to come with us. When he was so scared. You didn't do anything wrong. How could you know what was going to happen? I reasoned, trying more than anything to make myself feel less guilty. We didn't know what we were walking into. Emily let out a long sigh and tried to wipe her eyes with her jumper sleeve, smudging her makeup even further so it left angry black circles on her cheeks. I could see the pain in her eyes as she looked back up at me. You know, you're right. We didn't know. And that's why Jeremy's dead. The rest of the way home, we tried to work out what we would tell our parents. One thing was clear, we didn't want to tell our parents anything less than what had happened. Even though it was tempting to lie, try to make it look like we weren't crazy. The truth was, something supernatural happened inside the tank, and we wanted to at least tell our parents exactly what went down. 
We were going to tell them that there'd be another body at the bottom of the tank wrapped around Jeremy, even if it might be bad for us in the long run. We would be honest and hope the evidence would support us. For Jeremy. Parsky police found Jeremy's body alone at the bottom of the tower's water tank. There was no old woman attached to him. There was no water either. The tank was completely empty. Because our statements directly contradicted to what the police found, we we were both brought in for further questioning. We became the two main suspects in the mystery of how a local boy had drowned in an empty water tank. Although police could confirm we were with Jeremy the night he died, there was no physical evidence that suggested that we had caused his death. The case became a national media sensation, with TV reporters coming from all over to report on the story. Seeing Jeremy's tearful mother plead with us to confess to his murder really drove the nail, but I, I did sympathize with her. Losing a son was not a pain that I could yet comprehend. I barely saw Emily outside the police questioning during this time, and we were drifting apart as the reality being directly involved in the death of another person consumed us. Eventually, we were cleared of any crime by police, although Jeremy's family took us to civil court to try to get a, a ruling of manslaughter. That was settled out of court, though. Mom never told me exactly for how much. And then, well, we went on with our lives. Emily and her family moved away from Parsky while I was um, finishing my schooling there, despite virtually having no friends anymore due to the incident. And I um, moved away to UCLA, started earning my physics degree, trying to put the past behind me. And to be honest, I hadn't thought about what happened. You know, the fateful night that we visited the water tank on the edge of town for months. Until this morning when I got a text from an unknown number. Ty, it's Emily. Do you need to come back to Parsky? Another boy has died. We need to get to the bottom of this. For Jeremy. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you thank you for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's podcast. You can find Mr. Creepypasta Storytime on any kind of podcasting platform if you're watching on YouTube, and if you're listening to the podcast already, you can find Mr. Creepypasta on YouTube. <laughs> for those of you that are interested in seeing me do more than just tell scary stories, you can also check me out at twitch.tv slash Mr. Creepypasta. During the weekdays around 9pm Central Standard Time, I usually stream video games, and sometimes they're Resident Evil, and sometimes they're not. I'm also on Patreon. You can find a whole bunch of other people supporting on Patreon in the description down below, but there is a very, very special thank you to these people in particular. Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Creepypasta Adam, Ken Lando Higuchi, Mazakin, Champinsky, The Red Oak Shield Virus, G Weevil 3, Diana Krause, Steven Van Huss, Chance Burton, Tristan Pelton, Nico Cow, The Ginger Bros, Last Blade Song, Eliminator 86, Steampunk Sinner, Caleb Dougal, Sky Harbor, The Homeless Bird 93, Bobby Carmen, Liam Newman, Aaron Stormcrow, Barbara Maceo, Thomas Burgett, Azazel Rotten, S-Man, Kirisuba, Bad Honey, Someone You Love, Said the King 56, Somber Puppet, Wolfie Numbs, Shadow Morningstar, Sean Mills, Jesse Gonzalez, Mad Marstomp, Z Kearley, Cassie Core, Mr. Thud, and Patrick Schoolmeister. These guys are the real MVPs, and all of you who are listening are also the real MVPs. Stay safe, everyone, and sweet dreams. <laughs>